All right, and we are recording. Hey, Kat, how you doing today? I'm good. It's a crazy day, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We were chatting right before I hit the record button of how uh, everything that has been going on this morning, it's been kind of chaotic for both of us, but I'm so glad you're here. I have been a big fan and follower of your work for a few years, and so I am so thrilled that you agreed to be here and have a fun conversation with me. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll start there. Why don't we start with you introducing yourself, letting us know what you do and all the good things. All right, so my name's Kat. I am an RN. I was working full-time as an RN for 11 years and then I had my son, which I have a 17 year age gap. So I wanted to be home with him more. I appreciated it more being older than I did with my older kids. And so I've been reselling off and on since 1999, but like never stuck with it. So when I had him, I started building a business in order to hopefully cut back my hours. At the beginning of it, I didn't have the goal of quitting nursing, but it turned into that. So it took about two, two and a half years to build it up. And then I actually, my goal was to quit at the end of 2022. I got frustrated with work in February of 2022 and I just quit and walked out. And so I, for over two years now, have been strictly full-time reselling, which I do. eBay is our main income. We also do Poshmark Mercari and then occasionally whatnot. I was very heavy on whatnot the last year and a half, but the last about four months, I've kind of cut back a little bit on whatnot. Yeah, because I remember one of the first videos of yours that I saw was a jewelry video. It was, I think it was like a, a what sold kind of, kind of video. And so oh, probably one of the research ones. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I just was so amazed by how informative it was and how much you knew about these kinds of things, because I had just started selling um, jewelry probably back in 2020 ish. And um, like you, I've been selling on eBay off and on since 2007. So but I haven't been it's not like the whole time, you know, you do a few years, you take time, yeah. off, that kind of thing. So, and then the other thing that I really liked about you was that you were a nurse and you were a mom and you had kids and that that's what you wanted to be your priority. So the fact that you were able to make it work and you did so in, in my opinion, a rather quick turnaround time, um, I think that's really inspiring to a lot of people. I know it was for me. Yeah, it it I, I think a lot of people don't see the work that goes in. I'm sure you know right. as like full time reseller, it's almost like you're always working. So that's that's kind of right. one of the downsides, but I I love doing it. All right. So when you were start when you started, did you have a specific niche of what you were focusing on as it related to selling? Because like I said, I found you doing jewelry research. So let's talk about how you figured out what works and what you were going to sell and all that. So I am very, very random. And I think that's one of the things that stopped me from reselling like off and on throughout the years. I get very, very bored easily. So I kind of jump from niche to niche. So like we have 7,000 items in our store and it is a really big variety because I'll kind of hone in on one thing. Like when you found me, I was doing a lot of jewelry and then I kind of get bored with it and I'll switch it up. So I might buy like tons of jewelry for five months and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. And I might not buy anymore for a year. So oh, I've done okay. jewelry, I've done scarves. A lot of my research videos are stuff that I have kind of like honed in on and like, or big lots. So if I find big lots on auction, I will buy those. I became a expert on license plates because I found 1200 on an online auction from an uh, antique dealer. And then scarves, this is another thing. I just jump so much because I get bored so easy. So that's one of the things I like and that I think has made me keep doing it this time without 
quitting and getting bored is changing up what I'm doing all of the time. Yeah. You, and it's funny because that's how I started too. I just kind of started with whatever I could find that I thought I could sell and make money on. That's what I listed. That's what I sourced. But as the years went on, I realized I didn't have a ton of space. <laughs> right. So I kind of moved into jewelry at a necessity just because I couldn't store 6,000 items in my house, you know, because I didn't want to spend money for a storage unit or a warehouse or anything like that. So I understand that and I get bored too sometimes, but I think what's fun for me is the more I learn about jewelry, the more I, I like it, you know, and it, it, it becomes less boring because I'm learning so much, but it's also overwhelming too. So how do you, how do you keep yourself um, from not getting overwhelmed when you're selling so many different things? I think it's just learning as I'm buying them. So like, oh, and nice. I think jewelry is something that there is so much of it. Like there are different, you know, like you've got costume, you've got the sterling silver. So jewelry, I think you could almost not necessarily, you're not switching the niche because it's jewelry still, but you could do, you know, sterling and then switch to costume and kind of still shake it up a little bit. And it's just researching whatever I have and learning as much as I can. And then I just, I, I know a lot. I know a little about a lot of things <laughs> is what I was trying <laughs> to say, you know, and I just pick up little tidbits and there's always more to learn. It doesn't matter what niche you're in. There's always something that no matter how much research you do, there's no way you can know everything. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. All right. So most of our listeners and viewers are in the jewelry category, but not not only. So how would you suggest if someone is getting started on eBay selling anything, jewelry, I don't know, dishes, whatever, how would you suggest they get started on the research part? Because like I said, from what I've heard in my own experience, the research part is the most intimidating. And it seems like you've got that really dialed in. You've really got that figured out. So I would love if you share your process on that part. I think, and for me, I don't know about you. I don't find a lot of jewelry in person. So most of my mm -hmm. jewelry purchases are online estate auctions, which is nice for research because you've got Google Lens you can use while you're looking at the online lots. And if they're marked, you can look things up. So the thing for me, and it just takes time to learn what sells and then more and more things will start catching your eye. So if something catches my eye, if I don't know what it is, I look it up and that's how I learn. And I just continue doing that. And I, as far as jewelry on eBay for me, and I don't know if you found this, I have found that unnamed pieces, unless they're sterling silver, are almost impossible to sell or they're going to take months or years to sell. So I would suggest only named pieces or sterling silver pieces because the jewelry category is saturated with overseas sellers. And right. A lot of those unnamed pieces, unless you, if you can keyword them well, like if they're, you know, an enamel, hand painted, something like that, then you can keyword them well. But if it's just a regular costume necklace that's not named, I, I would not pick it up because it's just super, super saturated. So stuff like that, I would lot up just to get rid of, you know, if you buy a big lot because you see some good things in it, then that's fine. But don't feel like you have to list every single piece because then you end up like me with thousands of things and some <laughs> things that take forever to sell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I have that right now, you know, stuff that I bought when I didn't know any better. And I said, oh, this looks good. <laughs> Let's buy that. And yeah. uh, but what I have learned, too, is it's much easier for me to sell those unbranded and unmarked pieces uh, in a live show, you know, because people yeah. can see what it is and you just say a beautiful beaded bracelet or whatever. And yeah. they see, Oh yeah, I like that. You know, and they don't really care about the name, but obviously you're not going to get as much 
for it if it were, you know, a name brand piece or maybe even on eBay. But that's how I have been kind of liquidating all of those quote unquote yeah. bad guys just so I can move them and recoup that money so I can buy the better pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's what I was doing. And I, like I said, with whatnot, we've kind of slowed down because I feel like it has kind of gotten saturated, especially in the jewelry category. Yeah. So stuff that was selling well for us, you know, six months ago, now we have a hard time selling. And I don't know if you're selling, like, are you doing live selling on whatnot mainly or? Uh, actually, Poshmark. Going? Poshmark isn't oh. as isn't as saturated as I tried whatnot. Posh. <laughs> I tried Posh, and I did not. I I didn't do well with it. Yeah, I do really well with Poshmark. As a matter of fact, um, I don't do that well on whatnot because uh, I guess because I'm still I don't have a huge following, you know, and I only have you know, I mean a, a couple hundred maybe followers there. But on mm -hmm. Poshmark, you know, you are already had like a big following and not that that really matters, but it's much easier to get people to just kind of stumble into your show. And there's yeah. not as many jewelry sellers on Poshmark. Um, so a lot of the big sellers who do jewelry and whatnot, they're not on Poshmark. So I don't feel like yeah. the competition is is as much. And um, it's like on Poshmark, I have people actually waiting, you know, before I start my show, which is so nice. <laughs> you know, that never yeah. happens or whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I might need to try. I only tried twice and then I kind of gave up on it. But that was when I was doing really, really well on whatnot. So I was mm -hmm. like, for me, there was not a reason to go on to Posh, but I'm, I might have to try it again and see. Oh, I love it. It's, it's the only, it's the only way I'm selling my jewelry right now. I mean, I haven't listed on eBay in about a month uh, because I've been doing really well with Poshmark Live and they're making, I mean, they've made some improvements too. Cause I know when it first started, um, it was kind of glitchy and clunky and it wasn't really seamless, but now they've added a couple of features that make it a lot easier. So yeah, I, I think you would do well, especially because everybody knows you and they know the type of items that you sell. So I think you would do really well. Yeah, I might I might have to try it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, well, let's talk about then. You did mention a little bit about sourcing um, on online, like online mm -hmm. uh, state sales or online auctions and stuff like that. If someone is a beginner, how would you... Uh, maybe give them some advice on how to get started sourcing that way. So I just actually put out a video last week with like step by step because it's oh, very, very intimidating for mm -hmm. the online sourcing. So I went over like five of the online auction sites I use and kind of things to look for. And the biggest thing for new bidders to realize is number one is if if auction companies will even ship because not all of them do. So you need to make sure that they will ship and then taking that shipping into account because I have come across not a ton, but there are some auction companies that don't want to ship. So they will charge you outrageous handling fees. I've seen it as high as $25 a lot. Yeah. Yeah or handling because they don't, they don't want to ship it. So making sure you read the shipping terms and kind of calculating that and the buyer's premium, you know, if you're on an estate auction, you're going to pay your bid price plus that premium, which the standard I've seen lately is like 20%, which is absolutely like it used to be 10. Now I see 20, 25% mm -hmm. that is kind of going into that. I like to see a couple of pieces and a lot that will pay for the whole thing. That's kind of my thing. If it's not a single higher dollar piece that I can research and that's where doing the research is a lot nicer when you're doing online auctions because you're not at a thrift store and rushed and worrying if you have signal, you know, you can look up if it's a signed piece, like if it's a, Monet butterfly. You can look up Monet butterfly brooch on eBay to at least get an idea of the value before you're bidding and putting your money. But don't forget to add in the premium, the buyer's premium and the shipping, because that could double, sometimes even triple the cost of a yeah. lot. And that's a lot. 
Yeah, I found that out the hard way too. When I first started <laughs> buying um, from online auctions, they had the uh, the auction fee. Well, first you have to pay like a dollar or something to be to even be able to bid. Then there yeah. was the um, auction fee, and because I wanted it shipped, there was a shipping fee. But then the shipping company, because the auction place doesn't ship, they outsource that. The shipping place charged me a packing fee, like a, yeah. a, an additional packing fee, in addition to the cost of the shipping, in addition to the shipping fee that I already paid on the auction site. Right. Yeah. So it, yeah, yeah. it like doubled it. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And I said, well, now this isn't even that, <laughs> that much of a deal, you know? Yeah, so sure. some, some auction companies will ship it themselves. So those are the ones I like to find because typically if they bring them to those stores like UPS, they're going to charge like three times what the auction company would if they do it themselves. So I'm, I spent like $600 on shipping on a lot, not very long ago, wow. which was crazy. Yeah, that's insane. So that is something that you do have to take into account. And then um, the other thing I've learned too is like you really need to to be knowledgeable when you're looking at the photos because there's no return. You know, you can't take them back. I mean, unless something yeah. happens and it's damaged. But even then, I don't think they really take returns. So you have to be really careful. Yeah, and you kind of pay to learn. And I think like if you find a good auction company that you like bookmark it or write it down. I have a couple that I buy from almost every time they have an auction because I've gotten good pieces from them. That doesn't mean I couldn't get bad pieces. And that's something I kind of covered as well is there are no returns. Everything is as is, where is you, if you don't see defects like brooches might have broken pens or missing stones that you just right. couldn't see. And that those auction companies, it's not like buying from someone on eBay. You can't return it. It is most of the time it's pretty clear cut in auction terms that it's as is where it is. And they have in-person preview, but most of the time we're buying from far away and we're buying ships. So we don't have the option to go into that auction house and preview it and look at the stuff in person. Yeah. I mean, I'm like you, I kind of focus on the local auctions because we have some here in, in Las Vegas. So now I just focus on those because then I just go pick up the stuff. You know, I don't yeah. have to worry about them shipping it or anything like that. So that's kind of where I have kind of narrowed, narrowed things down, at least for me. And hopefully other people can do the same, like you said, and focus on the local auctions. And then you won't have to deal with the shipping at all. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the other thing I wanted to ask you is, so you're at the point now where you have employees and yes. uh, I, you don't have to share dollar amounts or anything like that. But I want to know, how did you know you were ready for that? Like what what was your like uh, maybe your sales, daily sales or, or monthly sales? Like what was that looking like where you knew, OK, I need to hire help? I think the main thing for me and like my situation is so different from like a typical reseller because I have my two YouTube channels that are jobs in themselves. Right. And so for me, it was more of a time thing. I couldn't keep up with everything. And our goal for sales is $500 in sales a day. And that's still not even making that much after payroll, to be honest with you. Um, it like for us, we want to see a minimum of $500 in sales a day. I have, I have one full-time employee that does shipping as well as listing for me. And then I have a high school student that works for me and she does 20 listings a day. So she does a hundred a week and then the other employee will do shipping. And the big thing, because I think everybody is like, oh, I want somebody to work for me. Like everybody wants somebody to help them with the work. But a lot of what you don't realize is like you have to pay a payroll company to pay them unless you're going to pay them cash under the table, which I don't recommend because I want the business costs to offset my profits. So I want everything totally above board and 
you also have to pay their taxes. So you have to pay a portion of their FICA, you have to pay a portion of their Medicaid. So a uh, $12 or $13 an hour employee essentially is gonna cost you $20 an hour. And you have to make sure you're ready for that. And it's very, mm -hmm. I, it, it's stressful, and like it's stressful worrying about yourself when you're, you know, uh, you know, entrepreneur and doing your own business. But when you, start being responsible for other people's income as well it is like a notch up on on stress for sure so most people that contact me thinking they want somebody to work once i tell them like i just said the payroll company paying portions of their taxes they can't afford it and i think it's really important to make sure that you can and one of the things that a lot of people think is like they can pay somebody as a 1099 employee, but if they are at your house using your items to list things for you legally, most of the time they cannot be a 1099 employee because they're not oh. a subcontractor. And that means you have to pay them on payroll to be legal. And I guess you could probably do like 80 or you know one of the payroll companies but i think then they're going to charge you even more you'd probably be looking at like 25 dollars for a 12 dollar employee you know double the cost and i think a lot of people want the help but financially aren't ready you know to get it and i i pay one of my employees by the listing but i have to make sure they are still making minimum wage and i know minimum wage in a lot of states is up to $15 an hour now which again is putting you at like 20 25 dollars an hour you're paying someone to help you so it's really easy to lose lose all of your profits and payroll and that that's a hard thing for me. Like I had to, I had somebody helping with whatnot. I had to let them go. It, you know, because the whatnot sales started falling to where it just was not like I was losing money by doing whatnot shows and by paying somebody to catalog and help me set up the shows. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't profitable. So I think you have to be really really careful i know like j ride flips jake he mm -hmm. has two employees that are both just part-time so i could probably have like one listing for me and then the other one shipping and my payroll would be a lot lower but for me like i'm out thrifting doing videos i'm editing i'm recording and then i have for the other channel as well so my my YouTube by itself is a full-time job. So I just have to kind of offset and say, okay, I'm making less on eBay, but I do I make money on YouTube as well. So I think your typical reseller would probably want to be, I would say at like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month in sales before I like before I would hire someone. Uh, unless it's really, really part time because if and you want to have higher dollar items too, I would say is important. If you're paying them $2 a listing and you paid $5 for the item, now that cost is $7. So your profit's right. going to be less. And the thing I think a lot of people don't think is you're paying them when they list it, but it might not sell for three months or six months. So you have to put that money out when they're listing it versus when the item sells. So right. it, it's, I don't recommend it for most people. It is definitely like a higher level of stress. But for me, I just, I did, I couldn't do everything I was doing with the amount of time that I have. Right. And then if you add in, you know, your mom responsibilities, life responsibilities on top right. of that, your, your schedule, basically it's nothing then because I know how much time YouTube takes. I know how much time eBay takes. And then if it's not even just eBay, like how we said, you're doing uh, Poshmark, you're doing Macari or whatnot or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. not that it, it triples the amount of time, but there's just more to keep track of, right? There's yeah. more, more plates in the air or whatever. So let's talk about how you manage then your schedule and how you manage your time, because there's a lot of moms out there like us who are doing this because they need part-time money or Maybe they they want to work, but they can't, quote, get a regular job. 
So yeah. they turn to reselling. So let's talk about how you manage mom life, reselling life, YouTuber life, <laughs> all the things. Yeah. So for me, I try and do as much as I can while he's at school. Like right now he's at school. That has made it a lot easier. He started pre-K last year. So he's in kindergarten. But before that, I just had him with me. Like I would be in here in the shed before we had employees listing and he had toys in here and a desk in here and coloring books. So he was with me when I was working before. So now that he's in school, like when I go thrifting for my videos, I will drop him at school and then I'll go thrifting. Unless it's an estate sale, sometimes on the weekend he comes with me. He does like to come with me. Uh, but like my editing, most of my auction buying, which is a lot of time because that's where I source a lot, I will do while he is at school as well. So I try and get as much as I can in while he's in school. And then I might do still a couple more hours because if you think about it, if somebody's working nine to five, you know, they're gone that eight hours, but he, I look at it, look at it as at least he's here with me. So like he yeah. might be sitting on the couch doing his homework and I'm looking on an auction or putting up drafts for eBay. And at least I'm there with him. And I also, I pay somebody to clean the house because I just don't, I don't have time to do it. So that's something where I'm like, okay, if I get a few more sales, I can have somebody come in and clean and not have to worry about that. If I had to, it would make it a lot more difficult. And I think it's important to realize what your time's worth. And if you like that, like the house cleaning, mm. if you can pay somebody to do it and take something off of your plate, then it is, to me, it is worth paying the money to free up your time for the kids or for working on reselling more versus spending time cleaning the house. Yeah, or even just for your own sanity, right? It's one less thing yeah. to worry about <laughs> sure, because- yeah. Cause I know, I mean, and, and I just don't like cleaning. I mean, I love a clean house, but I don't, I don't like scrubbing <laughs> toilets. <laughs> right. So, okay. So how do you manage then YouTube then? Do you have a filming schedule? Do you have like certain days where you create content? So for my thrifting channel, which is my cat's treasure hunting channel, I am doing videos every other day now. So wow. typically when I go, I'm doing a video a day between the two channels. Um, and I just started doing that about a month ago. And so for the thrifting channel, when I go out, cause most of the thrift stores for me are about an hour or more away. I will go to three, four or five thrift stores and each thrift store is a video for me. So like I went out, when did I go out? Friday. Cause I went to a bunch of church thrift stores that are only open Friday and Saturday. And I went to five different stores. So that's actually five videos I recorded in five hours. And that's enough for 10 days of videos since I do them every other day. And we record the haul as I'm doing the video. So my car, my car is like a storage unit and I have different stores in different places in the car. Like I might have one in the trunk, one behind the driver's seat, one behind the passenger seat, because I have to keep them separated to be able to record the haul to show everybody what I got. And then for the Nurse Flipper channel, I try to record all three videos in one day. That way, the days that they come out, I'm just editing. So it's basically for both of them, I'll record a bunch in one day, and then I just edit them the day that I'm putting them out. Okay, so that's a lot because I know <laughs> how long it takes to film, like, because it's not just the filming, right? It's the driving to the thrift store. It's filming while you're in there. And then also trying to remember, you know, what you want to focus on in that particular video, like what your idea is or what your hook's going to be or what the focus is going to be or the story you're trying to tell. Then it's about having the footage so <laughs> it makes sense. Like you said, then it's about the editing. Then it's about showing the stuff. So it's not just like the hour it takes to film. I know it could take four hours sometimes just to to get like a 20 minute video. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I am OCD and I still respond to every single comment on both my channels and like my main channel, it can be like 50 comments in a day. So I also respond to every single comment still on both of the channels. Um, and that's just something I've done the four years since I've had the channel. That was one of my things is I wanted to be able to respond to everybody as long as I possibly can. All right. So then what is your, I mean, we talked about a lot. We talked about reselling. We talked about life. We talked about YouTube. We talked about auctions. What is your favorite part of reselling? What makes you love it the way you do? And to be so committed for so long on this reselling journey, what, you know, how did, how did that happen for you? Or what is it that keeps you, keeps you going? I think it's the learning. Like I love researching the videos. I just recorded a research video, the shock factor too, both for me and other people, you know, when you find something for a dollar and it sells for $300 that nobody would think yes. that most people would throw in the trash, you know, that, and they're like, we were talking about earlier, there's always something to learn. Like there's always something that will surprise you that you had no idea that it was worth so much. So I think the learning, it's the, the hunting, it's the treasure hunting and finding and learning. And I, I actually, I was talking about it on my, my video. I just didn't record um, <laughs> that, that, I want to start doing big stuff again. So we are lucky that we do have the room. Um, we mm. have three sheds and we have, I have a rental house that we've now turned into storage for eBay as well. So we have over 4,000 square feet of room. Most of it yeah. is filled um, with the 7,000 items, but I want to start doing furniture again. That's something I did a few years ago. And I think that there is so much profit, like you're talking hundreds of dollars of profit versus, you know, 10, 20 or $50. So I want to start finding furniture again and bigger items that bring bigger profits because that, that would, I think if you have the room, I think that would be the ultimate goal is to, you know, sell less items and make more money, you know, less work and more money. Absolutely. And and that's a, a much faster sell through rate because just from what I've heard and what I've learned, you know, when you find a couch or a table or something, it's not like you're going to really hold on to it for as long as you would, like you said, you know, books or certain pieces of jewelry and stuff like that. So I know you can flip those things fast. Now, when you do that, are you planning to do that on uh, Facebook Marketplace or eBay? So I, I'm actually, I'm banned on Facebook Marketplace, so I can't use oh. it. Um, my mom listed vintage license plates, which are not allowed on Facebook Marketplace. Um, and it got us permanently banned. Uh, oh. My husband does have it. So if I wanted to do it, I could, but I actually have sold them on eBay. So I was watching in one of the Facebook reseller groups and there's a couple of people that only sell furniture and they're, you know, these items are like 700, a thousand, two thousand dollars So when you're doing that, it takes 10 items versus three, you know, 300 items of average value to make the same amount of money. So I sold some Ethan Allen on eBay uh, several years ago. And then when the gas prices went up, I kind of stopped looking for furniture because the freight was just too much, but now it's come down a little bit. So I think freight's a little more reasonable again. And I think we're going to start looking like the research video I just did. There was a bunch of white wicker furniture that I feel like you see everywhere. Right. And like a dresser was selling for $700 like a, a nightstand, a small, and you can put that in a box that doesn't even have to go freight. You know, that could go in a three foot by three foot box and go UPS. So I think there's a lot of money in furniture and bigger stuff that I would like to learn a little bit more about. Yeah. And you're not going to have as much competition because most resellers don't have the space and they don't want to yeah. deal with the big bulky items because the shipping and all that. So uh, right. you're you're eliminating probably about 80 percent of resellers right there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I think a lot of it's very intimidating. It's very scary. But like we used U ship for freight. And with that, and I've done that for some higher dollar, like I sold a $3,000 painting, I sold $3,000 like Disney figurine, they come to your house and they wrap it up and take it like you once you get it to your house, you do nothing. They come to the house, they pick it up, they load it up and they bring it to your buyer's front door. Really? So that's almost yeah. like a con concierge kind of shit. It is. Yeah. yeah. You can do like white club. That's what I did with the Disney statue, which means they put it in the front with them where they have their eye on it oh. the whole time. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's interesting to know because that's another thing I learned too with selling um, higher end jewelry pieces. Uh, some buyers who are spending ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand or fifty thousand dollars on a, a necklace, that's what they want. They li they literally want someone to hand it to them. They don't want to have to go pick it up. They don't want to have to worry about right. somebody losing it or dropping it. So that's good to know, especially for us jewelry resellers, if we plan to kind of level up to that level, which is my goal. I know you said your goal is to move into the bigger items, and my goal is to move into the much more higher dollar like jewelry pieces. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm, I try to pick up those as well. It's just, I think the biggest thing, at least for me is like, you have to have that bankroll. You know, if you right. have a $10,000 necklace, you're probably going to pay $2,000 plus unless you're at really least. lucky. And so that's the biggest thing with that. I think is because I like I just sold a $450 necklace, which isn't a ton, you know, but that's getting up there. And that's the same thing. Like if we could sell 10 $400 pieces versus 80, you know, for $20. And that's still not even the money and do less work than we should. And that's where the research comes in. Like my piece was a Zuni artist. It was signed. I got an online auction. I paid 120 and there were actually none listed of this. There were none on eBay. There were none on any other site. There were none on WorthPoint, but I found the artist website. So I knew what she was selling the piece for, which was about $700. So I priced it at 650. It actually sold on Poshmark for an offer of $450. But only being 120 in, I accepted it because I'm like, no, that's like a $250 profit. And it was in under a month. So it was a pretty fast turnover as well. Yeah. So you're right. It's basically about front loading that knowledge and that education. So you know a good deal or you know something unique and rare as soon as you see it. You know, and I think that's what also scares a lot of people is sometimes they don't even trust themselves. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, I don't know about this or I don't know. And so they don't do anything. But yeah, I'm trying to help people kind of get past that, you know, with this podcast and, you know, talking to people like you who have actually done it. Yeah. And I think the research thing, like starting paying up and I've been paying up for a couple of years now. I think you have to be kind of secure in the fact that you can research it, whether it's worth point or eBay, you're seeing sold, you know that this item will sell. So paying, like I had Judith Lieber purses. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Oh yeah. I paid $800 a purse. They're little Menadiers and they sold for $3,000 each. But again, that $800 investment for, somebody, especially somebody new, like most people don't have that bankroll. I don't have the bankroll to go buy a bunch of pieces like that. You know, I have to buy sporadically, you know, maybe five pieces here and there, wait till they sell and then I can get some more. And I think having that confidence and knowing that you're seeing those solds, like I saw it on WorthPoint, I saw what they were selling for on eBay and just knowing, okay, I did my research, so I'm okay to pay $800 for a purse. And I got lucky <laughs> they sold in a month, but they could have taken six months to a year. And then you have that $1,600 that's kind of just sitting there, you know, kind of locked in as an investment essentially. But if you, that's where I've been trying to impress this. I haven't impressed this a lot on my channels is the, the sell through rate, mm -hmm. you know, because if you've got uh, an expensive item, 
but the sell through rate is low. You have to decide, do you want to make the investment when it's something that's probably going to take a year or more to sell? And some people do and some people don't, but learning how to calculate, you know, how long is this going to take to sell, I think is super important when you're investing your money. Yeah, because it's not only because I was actually just talking about this with handbags because I've done the same thing. I've spent now I, I try not to spend over a hundred dollars, but I saw a, <laughs> a bag that I spent a hundred dollars on. Luckily, I was able to sell it for four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But even still, it you know, it's taking the risk of having your money tied up because it's not only the money it's tied up, but now I'm also taking on the risk of storing it you know, I'm taking on the risk if, if it gets lost, damaged, stolen, right? Like all of that's on me while I'm waiting for it to sell. And right. so you really have to be comfortable with that too. You have to be comfortable with now you are taking a risk on something that, like you said, may not sell for a while. Or if you have it in your storage and, and something happens, something spills on it, or <laughs> I don't know. Right. And, and, and it could, it. or it could get lost in shipping. And I think that's something important to kind of remember too. Like, anything you have could get lost or damaged in shipping. Even doing like the white glove service, it's still something could happen. You know, that is mm -hmm. a possibility. And being, I think that that holds a lot of people back, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is like the, this is retail, you know, it's e-commerce, but it's retail. And most retailers are building in a percent for theft, for loss, you know, for breakage. And that's something that we need to as well for returns. Like I just, I just had somebody and I swear he cut a hole in the sweater because he wanted me to give him a partial refund. We looked at our oh. pictures. There were not holes. He was messaging back and forth with me for days, trying to get me down on the price. I wouldn't go down. He finally bought it. And then he, three days after he gets it says, Oh, there's a hole. I need a partial refund. And I'm actually, I'm going to make him send it back because I really feel like he damaged it, but right. that's, a risk. It's there, but it's so minimal and it doesn't happen that often. I think people are scared of like the what ifs, but the reality is all of this stuff rarely, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it rarely happens, but you need to be prepared in case it does. And, you know, and it sucks. It's, I think I have like eight open returns right now. We typically don't get a lot, but for some reason, the last month we have been flooded with like, doesn't fit, don't like it. Like just different silly things. The guy that cut the hole in the sweater and he, he hasn't opened a return. I'm kind of calling his bluff is what I'm doing. He, has, he hasn't opened a return yet, but, um, you know, that it's something that can happen, but I think the, fear of something happening stops people a lot. And you know, from what, like, even if you lost $3,000 on something like we, between all the platforms, we had over $400,000 in sales. So why would I let a $3,000 possible loss scare me from making 400,000 in sales? You know, it just, it, it, it's, I feel like it's an unrealistic Fear. If you really look at it, like, what are you losing by being scared of what if compared to what you actually could do? Yeah. See, you have a much more refined um, business entrepreneurial mindset, because I think a lot of people who go into this, I mean, I know that develops over time, but a lot of people don't think the way you do. And I think that's one of the many reasons why it sets you apart because you think about things differently. Most people are just like, oh, I just want to make some money. I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to get a return. I don't want any negative whatever. And so um, the fact that you take that into account and into consideration as your overall business and that it happens, like I said, I think that's a whole different mindset that people don't realize that they need to um have, you know, when they're trying to do this. And I think that yeah, comes with experience. I, I, I was going to say, I, <laughs> I think you have the nail on the head. Like I haven't, like I used to get so mad and angry about returns. I like, I would right. get livid. And, like this guy is kind of irritating me. I won't lie. But I think it, and somebody told me this years ago, and I think the big thing with returns and stuff is, is like, it's not personal, it's business, you know? And yeah, 
as long as you get the item back, like we actually, and it was our mistake, this return was totally justified. And it was somebody else though wanting a return or a refund. And I kind of put my foot down. And I think that's important with the returns is you over time will learn who might be trying to get a partial refund. Like they're going right. to complain about little things that most people would not complain about. And I sold a Tiffany, a sterling silver cup um, and it was etched and my employee did not show the etching. So I a hundred percent agree with the buyer, you know, that the etching should have been shown, but I accepted an offer from him that was lower than I really wanted to take. So I was not willing to give him more off because the etching wasn't shown. And I told him, no, send it back. I'll give you a full refund. And I did. And came back, we made sure we showed the etching in the listing when we put it back up and it sold for full price in a week. So a lot of times, as long as you're getting these items back, you're still going to get the money. And a lot of times it sells for more than it did in the first place. Cause in my experience, the people that return it are the ones that are sending lower offers or trying to get a better deal and they're people that are a little bit harder to please. So that's why we have almost taken on a full, either you return it for a full refund or we don't do partials. And I think that's a good stance for most people to take. I will do partials if it's our fault. We realize that like we've had other clothes that they say there's a hole. We go look at the picture and we're like, oh yeah, we see there was a hole. We didn't notate it. Those cases we will do partial, but like with this guy, there's no hole in that sweater. Like we do high resolution pictures. I'm pretty sure he damaged it. So if he does open the return, I will take 50% out of his return to compensate us for the damage that I'm pretty sure that he did to the sweater. Right. And But most of the time, you get the stuff back. I know I've heard, and I'm sure everybody's heard like the horror stories of people sending like an empty box. I have never had that happen. I have gotten my items back. We did, we did just get an Hermes scarf back that somebody spilled something on a $300 scarf. Oh, um, wow. So, but I still think it'll sell for $250. My initial investment was a hundred. So I think even with that, that we're still, we'll still make a profit on that. So I think most of the time, as long as you're buying low, even, you know, with the return, you should still make money unless somebody totally damages your item. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, luckily I haven't had any return horror stories either. You know, I, I did have somebody, because I used to sell like crystals and stuff and the guy actually broke the crystal to try and prove to me it wasn't what I said it was. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so yeah, I only gave him a 50% return, but I'm like, it's fine, you know, just return it. But he's like, this isn't what you said. Here, yeah. look at the pictures. And he he admitted that he broke it. And, you know, just I had somebody <laughs> light some jewelry on fire a couple of- Are you serious? Ago. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, and it actually, it was faux stones and I said it was faux stones and then they lit it to prove it was faux stones, which I already knew. And so they melted the, yeah. Oh gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. But, um, all right, so before we wrap up, um, what does your future reselling journey look like? Share with us what you have coming up or what you have planned. I know you talked about doing the big stuff, but yeah. you know, wh what direction do you see things going from this point on at this stage in your reselling career? For me, I think the higher, not just the bigger stuff, but bigger profit items has definitely been a goal for a long time. Um, I've been starting watching some people that are doing those bigger like stove tops and like ridiculous stuff that most of us look at and are like, I'm not going to ship that. So I want to kind of get past that. I'm not going to ship that mindset. Yeah. And because I have my hu my husband's here, he can build a pallet to put these things on and, you know, we can have somebody pick it up on a pallet. Um, so I think definitely looking at the higher profit stuff and the the furniture as well. The jewelry I am trying to do mainly higher dollar stuff. I'm going to try whatnot again. I have, um, 
I, I might try doing some wholesale lots. I've tried doing it before and it's really hard as a reseller to get past the mentality of what I can sell it for individually and be able to like, you know, give that in a big bulk lot to somebody else. Um, but I'm really, really good at sourcing. So that might be something we kind of toy with as well. And then hopefully growing the thrifting channel. I've been, I've been finding a lot of stuff thrifting. I have to drive that hour or two hours, but I've been finding new stores, you know, that I didn't know were there. So thrifting and finding it in person as well. And unfortunately here in Florida, there's not a ton of like glass and breakables. So we just don't find it. There's never jewelry at, at the thrift store. There's costume, you know, lower end yeah. stuff, but I've not seen anything else. So yeah, I think just built the, the ultimate goal is to sell less stuff for more money. You know, hopefully yeah. I, I don't want any more employees. I would rather have less employees um, <laughs> that, you know, I, I don't want to get to where we need more people because again, that stress from payroll is like, it is real <laughs> and um, super, super stressful. And you got to make sure like I'm, I, you don't have to, I make sure everybody else gets paid before I do. So sometimes there might not be enough for me to get, you know, a right. full pay because I got to make sure everybody else has it. Um, but yeah, that, and I said last year, my goal was to reach half a million in sales. I hit four, <laughs> I've hit 400,000 two years in a row. And that is not profit. I want everybody to know that is by no means profit. Um, and 200,000 of that last year was whatnot, which was, is like less than a 50% margin. So wow. um, we spent a lot of money to make that money. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I would, I would like to hit that half a million in sales, even though it's nowhere near the profit, but, you know, be able to do that. Hope, hopefully this year, I don't know though, cause I haven't had whatnot these first three months. So right now it's not looking great, but hopefully soon. Yes. And you said you're doing what, 20 listings a day? So I, my high schooler does 20 listings a day and then my mm -hmm. full-time person, it depends on how much she has to ship. Um, this weekend I put up 200 drafts. I was actually way far behind mm -hmm. them because of going out and thrifting and editing videos. I wasn't getting the drafts up. So I actually try to get, I would say 30 a day on average that we put up which is what theoretically we want to be selling as well. You know, if I'm putting up 30, we would like, I don't want my store to grow. That is not one of my goals. I would like <laughs> it to go down. Yes. That's funny. Cause I, I made that realization too early on. I said, actually, I don't want my store to grow. I want stuff to be going out just as fast as I'm putting stuff in. Yeah. And I, it's funny because a lot of times, you know, when you're in the, in the Facebook groups with the sellers, they all say, oh, I'm trying to get to a thousand listings. I'm trying to get to 5,000 listings. And it's like, well, yeah. I don't know if that's really what you trying should be Trying to make a living on a hundred listings would be beautiful. And yes. some people do. Some people do. Oh, like that would be a beautiful thing, you know, have a hundred listings and make $20,000 a month and be golden. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be amazing. I would love that. I, I mean, and only have to maybe ship out four items a day instead of 22, you know, and right. my shipping yeah. wouldn't take that long. Yeah. That would be, that would be epic. <laughs> For sure. So, okay. Um, any final tips or advice or words of wisdom for anybody I, selling, reselling? I think the big thing, like we said, like, is not being scared of like what might happen. Cause the reality mm -hmm. is all this bad stuff rarely, rarely happens doing research. And again, the sell through rate, you know, how many have sold in the last 90 days compared to how many are listed is really, really important if you don't want stuff to sit. And like you said, you don't have a lot of space. So I think kind of tailoring your business to your needs, like I have the space so I can do that bigger stuff. But if I didn't, like you're doing jewelry, I think like handbags don't take up a ton of space. Vintage linens, I love handkerchiefs. Another, you know, small things, postcards, all of the smaller stuff, you can do it in a smaller space. You just have to 
I think I feel like you have to be a lot pickier, you know, because you don't have the room for that stuff to sit. And I think just starting, you know, the best way to learn is by doing and you're going to make mistakes. I still make mistakes. I think we all do. And yeah, we all do learn, it. learn, don't do it again. You know, sometimes it takes twice, but <laughs> Yeah, learn from your mistakes, but don't be don't be scared to start is the biggest thing because that's the hardest thing I feel like, right? Is like getting that first listing up and actually doing it is the hardest thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then, you know, also having the courage to keep doing it, right? Because it, this is the business of consistency and this is the business of, you know, constantly upgrading your knowledge, constantly upgrading your systems and your sourcing and all of the things that go into really making this work and making it profitable. So I think it takes a lot of time um, in that way, but it it doesn't necessarily have to, depending on how driven you are or how disciplined right. you are. So I think there's a certain type of, um, I don't know, maybe a, a personality or, or characteristic where, you know, some people you see them, they just kind of take off with it. And then some of us, it takes us a little bit longer, but, you know, eventually we manage and we figure it all out. Yeah. And I think it, it like with that, it's important to do like what you like and what you know, and not force yourself to learn about things that you don't like, you know, because right. that makes it a lot harder.